Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday in the Word. We're uh, ready to get started tonight. Appreciate this beautiful day. Hope, hope many of you got to go out and enjoy this marvelous, sunshiny weather, 70 degrees, 72, something like that. It was a good day to be out and about, right? So uh, hopefully you got to enjoy some of that today, even if you worked uh, inside, hopefully you got to get out, at least on your lunch break or on a particular break, and you got to get out and appreciate the the seasonal changes that the Lord is, uh, that he has set and established firmly in the earth, and and uh, we can, uh, we learn how to accommodate, amen, and acclimate to those changes, so, uh, but we're glad you're here tonight. We're glad you're with us. We trust that you are uh, enjoying these, uh, this particular series, but all these broadcasts, hopefully you are enjoying all the live streaming. And, and um, if uh, you want to, if you've never liked our Facebook page, uh, feel free to do that. Feel free to like our, our page and you can follow us if, if that's a thing. And uh, you can also, uh, if you, you can share too if you'd like. It's uh, you know you can feel free to share the page, get the word out. People that you think would be would benefit or be blessed by uh, the quality of the content that we are delivering here uh, you can do that. For those that you know that don't Facebook, uh, you feel free to share YouTube link with them. Have them like. Have them. They can like them, subscribe, and get notified whenever we every time we put up a new video, which is pretty much twice a week at this point. So anyway, we're uh, grateful for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. If you uh, are here in Jackson County, we say hey. If you are um, doing something a little different tonight with this, so if you are not dwelling or living in Jackson County here in West Virginia. If you're somewhere else, how about dropping your state, city, state in the comments and just let us know, uh, just as a curiosity, how far we're, how far the, the reach is. So uh, that would be cool. We'd appreciate that if you can do that. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. We hope and pray that you're blessed. Uh, so we have been, for the past <clears throat> eight weeks, we have been uh, speaking and sharing on resetting creation. And one of the important aspects, uh, in, at least in my mind, for just the entire uh, series and focus of, of these uh, Wednesday nights uh, uh, has been to see the correlation, the comparisons, the contrast uh, between the original creation in Genesis and the resetting of creation in the time of Messiah, in the life of Christ, his ministry, his redemptive work, his redemptive character. Uh, all of these things have a, a kind of uh, laced together and intertwined and I have, uh, I'm firmly believe that if um, the better we understand creation and how it connects to the new covenant, uh, then the better we will understand the new covenant because it will bring us to light, life, newness, uh, and even a renewal for some of us who have been uh, you know, at this for a while. So, uh, so um, lean back, sit in your in your recliner, your couch, your love seat, your beanbag chair, <laughs> whatever you sit in, however you enjoy it. Uh, maybe in your bed with your phone or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. So glad that you're with us, and we're going to uh, we're going to get started tonight. Amen. So this is part nine, Resetting Creation, and I want to uh, 
uh, get started with a familiar verse out of, I'm going to read the first seven verses of Genesis 3. I am going to do my very best to not exegete my way through this. That means break it down word by word, verse by verse. Uh, and I'm going to try not to do that. I want to read this just for context and just to set the idea here that, that you know, we've been comparing so many different things uh, from the original creation and the story of, you know, particularly since we've honed in on Adam being a figure of him that is to come, right? And, and so that he is a, a comparative uh, source a you know a, a comparison and contrast, if you will, uh, to show us the uh, the other side of the coin from what Messiah did, and so uh, all these elements, all these aspects of creation, somewhere show up in his life and ministry, and absolutely, uh, we if we're looking for them and we see them, then they then. That adds a level of clarity, I hope and trust, that is uh, very beneficial, that it, that it uh, encourages you forward in your journey, encourages you onward and upward, and, uh, and enhances your desire to uh, love, serve, and otherwise uh, give yourself to the King of Kings, all right? So, anyway... I want to talk about temptation. I want to talk about what temptation is and some of those things tonight, but that's not all I want to talk about. So we want to I want to try to get my uh, self wound up in here. So um, Genesis three, let me lay this over here for a minute. Genesis three, the first seven verses. We pick this up. We are in Eden, paradise, the garden of the Lord. All right, and it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So I'm going <laughs> to stop here and point something out. That is that whenever God speaks and declares and gets specific about some stuff, I will, you can just about expect that there will be a counterpoint to what he has pointedly said. So God has given them the directive about not eating from one tree. And so the serpent, who is more subtle, he's craftier, he's... Uh, more conniving, he's, um, um, you know, the he's uh, just very, very capable of uh, of um, turning things around on uh, on people, right? And and he so he asked the question: As God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So there's a little bit of a in, in Eve's rendition of the commandment, which she wasn't literally present when it was given, because God gave that to Adam before he drew uh, Eve out. Uh, but she had a, enough of an understanding to know that you weren't supposed to eat it. But because you weren't supposed to eat it, I would just not. We're not going to touch it. We're not going to mess with it. We're not going to do anything, right? Because it's it's going to kill you. And the serpent said unto the woman, "You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, 
and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. That's all the farther I want to go with that part of this right now. So if I were wanting to settle in and teach on this, we would, we would get after it. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot to mine or to dig out or discover in, in this, but I'd, I'm not after the particulars. What I want you to, what I want to do is I want to show you that this is, this is the moment. This is the critical moment. This is the, the, when, uh, the, um, uh, the world is won or lost, is in this moment, this decision point, this, this uh, opportunity to adhere to what God says or to uh, deviate. So let me say some things that, that I was thinking today about temptation. And so temptation is the packaging or the wrapping uh, is packaging and wrapping the forbidden in falsehood. So, and, it's, and, and if it's a falsehood, it's not, it may be not an outright lie, it can just be a partial truth, okay? So, remember, take that into consideration, but it is also offered in the pretense of harmlessness, which means, nah, it can't hurt you. And you see some of those things even in your own life, in your own, you know, in, in the way that, you know, we have uh, failed in days gone by, uh, you know, you get tempted to behave and do certain things or, or, you know, things of that nature. And you think you're curious about them, you want to do them and you think, well, if I do that, then, you know, maybe it really ain't as bad as they said. And then for, in most cases, it winds up being a whole lot worse, right? Uh, you know, maybe not in every case, but the result of it is uh, is that you not just mess up, then you got all the guilt and the shame and all that other stuff that goes along with it, right? So, but I was also thinking this about temptation, and this is, I think this is a, this was an interesting thought, and this one showed up today as I was setting and looking over this stuff and spending my time uh, prepping for this today, and it says, Temptation is a is the doorway into an alternate reality. Think about that for a minute. That's a that's a that really hit my spirit today as I was praying about that and thinking about thinking about how can I describe this. What happens is temptation opens a door, and if you go through it, your life changes. And in some ways, in some ways, there's no coming back from it. In, in some instances and in some circumstances and some experiences. That being said, to a degree, there's a certain amount of it that, you know, that you have to try. So now you're in a whole different, you're, you're on a different path. Now it may, it may re, uh, it may diverge from the, and come back into where you, where if you stayed on the other path, it, God has a way of bringing it back in to, his, to the fullness of his love and mercy, and I believe that with all of my heart. Uh, but it is the doorway to an alternate reality. I believe, to think about that, then the, then the way Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples in the garden, and he says, you know, and he tells them to enter not into temptation. That's, in the light of that statement, that makes that, a, that adds a little bit of uh, substance to that for me. So he's saying, don't go through the door. Don't, you know, I mean, to stand and to be tempted to go through the door. Temptation in and of itself is not a sin. How do I know that? Because Jesus didn't sin and he was tempted. And so one of the scriptures that we're going to read in a little bit is that he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, right? So, so temptation is the opportunity to, to step into a variant or al alternate reality of life. 
And so I would, uh, uh, it's good that we have our wits about us. It's good that we're paying attention. It's, it's great that we can figure out that, wait a minute, this may not be in my best interest. And so if you can, if you can figure out not to enter into the door, then go through the door, then you may have preserved your life, at least for that season or life as you know it. Amen. So anyway, why talk about temptation? Well, well, Jesus submitted and made himself available to temptation. Why? Because that's part of the story. Overcoming temptation sets us on the other side of victory, right? Adam went through the door and produced an alternate reality. Even Adam went through the door of temptation. They ate the fruit, and then their life changed. No more, no more paradise. Uh, all of this awareness, all of this, uh, the realization that that they're going to die, and that their their uh, their uh, life's going to be hard. Uh, their sorrows are multiplied. Uh, it's going to get. It's going to bite, sting, and itch you know, thorns and thistles, it's going to yield. So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, there's, it's going to get more difficult because you're not in a fenced garden anymore. You're not in the place where God walks with you in the cool of the day. Now, God, to his credit, now says, I, I, I'm turning you out into the world, but I want to come and live with you. I don't want to stay here and wait on you to not be able to find your way back to me. I'm going to come to where you are, and then I'm going to lead you and reveal to you that this paradise is not just a place geographically, but it's a relationship that will open up to you, and you'll start to understand and see it in the context that it was that it is absolutely the most fitting and best suited for you and I in this new dimension, okay? So I got ahead of myself by a long shot there, but we're we're going to uh we're we're going to kind of back up a little bit here. But that's the importance of what temptation, why it matters. Why does it matter that Jesus was tempted? Because Adam was tempted and he failed the test. Adam was tempted and he succumbed and he brought us down. Jesus is tempted and he emerges victorious and now, hallelujah, because he lives, we can live also. Because of all that he has done, because of his victory, he because he conquered, because he was victorious, you and I can be more than conquerors and we can be triumphant also because we draw from him. Amen? So let's jump over here to Luke chapter 4 and verse 1, verses 1 and 2. And I want to deal with this. Also, you're going to find this in, if you want to read two other accounts, and you, I'm not going to read the whole account out of Luke, Luke 4, because typically you would read probably uh, all the way to verse 14, be Luke 4, 1 through 14. I'm just going to read the first two verses again because I'm after a specific thing. But if you want to read more and look at it more in a uh, in you know in a uh, more detailed light, you feel free to do that. You will also find it in the first chapter of Mark, verses twelve and thirteen. You will also find it in Matthew chapter four, and I would recommend the first eleven verses of Matthew chapter four. But I want to go to Luke four one and two, and it says, "And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan." and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, and he afterward hungered. So I just want to stop there, because I don't want to get into, again, the, the mechanics of his temptation. But other than just to touch on the very, on the very first element of it, and the context in which this comes... Uh, the temptation of Christ occurs on the heels of God publicly affirming his sonship, right? In Luke 3, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River. 
because Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. So he is from the, at the moment he's baptized, there's a voice from heaven. John sees the dove descend on him and, and calls him the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world, right? And then when he's baptized, then, then the Father speaks from heaven and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So God is in him and he's pleased to dwell in him. He is pleased to live there. What does that say? Remember what I said earlier about, about God being willing to come out of paradise to live where we are? That was part of the plan of the tabernacle of Moses. If you build it after the pattern of heaven, then I will come and dwell with you. God wanted to be where the people were. The perfect place for God to be where the people are was not to build something out in the midst of the community, so to speak, but it was to come and dwell well and write his law and write his heart and his and his word on the minds and hearts of the of the people in whom he would inhabit in whom he was pleased to dwell hallelujah and so then we become the temples of the holy ghost we are the we are the temple of god jesus spoke of the temple of his body in john chapter 2 there's so many things we can say i'm starting to get warmed up right but, but what I'm after here is, is that God speaks sonship. Now, I believe that Jesus already knew he was the son of God. I don't know that Jesus needed that to be publicly offered, but the world needed to hear what God had to say. God said everything that God says from the heavens in the life of Christ always points and turns the attention of the audience to Jesus as the focal point. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Boom. So the focus is, the attention is, they hear the voice from heaven, but their gaze is directed to his son. Well, on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased Hear ye him. Listen to what he's got to say. Again, you hear me speak from the cloud, but I'm directing it. If I can direct your attention to the image and the likeness, my likeness in my son, I'm invisible. You can't see me, but you can see me in my son. Amen. You can see me and you can see, you can understand and comprehend me when you understand and comprehend the son. So the idea, and that's S-O-N, not S-U-N. So just to be clear, now, what we're looking at here is that, is that Adam had heard not to eat of this tree. He had communicated that to Eve. Looks like it, she either uh, heard it with uh, some extra strings attached to it or whatever. But the idea here is, is that what God has just said, what God has has just uttered and spoken and 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 decreed uh, that then the temptation that when the tempter comes the craftiness and the subtleness is to try to take the edge off of what God has just said it's to try to either uh, uh, turn the words or manipulate the phrase or get us to somehow to cheapen it to dilute it to uh, to weaken it or, or, or to make it seem like there's uh, you know it's not uh, it's not everything God said it was going to be okay and so when we start dealing in those half truths and partial truths and we are dealing with what is wrapped up in falsehood right what's wrapped up in in, in it's, you know, I, I, we use the phrase a lot, unvarnished truth. And unvarnished truth is truth without any shine on it, right? And so what a lot of folks do is they put a little bit of varnish, or not just a little bit of varnish, but a little bit of varnish with stain in it on it, and it kind of takes away from some of the natural beauty of the grain of truth that you are, that you are presenting. And so that's, so, you know, those things need to be, uh, uh, you know, they need to be understood and um, received with 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 wisdom and with caution and with a, with a degree of of awareness because 
you know, this, this is what you got to do. So anyway, what I'm after here is, is that God has just finished a, a publicly affirming the sonship of Jesus as the Messiah in front of the audience at the river. And so it is there that Jesus is led by the Spirit. What is it? It's a creation reset, the new man. The old man was tempted and he fell, but the new man must go to a place. Where does he go? All right? It, this comes on the heels. When does it happen? It always comes on the heels very close when God speaks, when God has something to say. Then the, then the temptation kind of comes in to kind of dilute it, sweep it aside, make it seem, uh, make it diminish it in some capacity. Uh, you know, why does he do it? Uh, you know, he... Uh, you know, he probes for doubt and disagreement and, and thus plays on the need to prove ourselves. And where does he do it? He does it in the wilderness, right? Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. What is the wilderness? Well, the first temptation happened in a garden, right? And so you've gone thousands of years. Jesus Christ's temptation, he goes to the wilderness. A wilderness is an unkept garden. Amen? So think about that for a minute that what got what had happened to the old man or the first man in paradise to recapture paradise to recover it to restore it to make it relevant to humanity again then Jesus must be tempted and so he goes into the wilderness and he is there and he he spends 40 days uh, enduring the onslaught uh, handling everything that's brought at him. He even fasts for that length of time. And so the very first thing that he prays upon is this idea that uh, he prays on his weak spot, which is his hunger, right? If you haven't eaten anything for 40 days, you know, there's some things that, that maybe aren't even kosher as a young Jewish man that might look pretty good to you, all right, because you're just hungry, you know, anyway, that being said, I'm not saying that that was the case, particularly uh, just kind of a generalized statement of, of hunger. And so what, uh, what the uh, adversary does, excuse me, what the adversary does then is he says, if you're the son of God. Well, God's already declared him to be the son of God with power. He's already declared him to be the beloved son in whom he's well pleased. What do you mean? He's, he got the memo right? I mean, he's figured out who he was pointing to and who he was talking to. So now what he has to do is try to spin it, try to take it, try to manipulate the, uh, the agent of the truth and try to turn him to where he can make use of him and lessen as in um, L-E-S-S-O-N, maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure I got that right. Anyway, sorry about that. But he's going to diminish. Let me say it to you this way. Try to minimize his impact on the world. If he can do this, unless he can turn it for himself, then that's what he's going to do. But he says, if you're the son of God, it's lesson with an E, L-E-S-S-E-N. That means to make less, okay? So let me get that right. With the O-N, it has to do with communicating a, a uh, instruction of some kind. Gotcha. All right, sorry, That's imp that stuff's kind of important to me. Anyway, uh, so what he says to him is, is if you are the son of God, take these stones and command them to be made bread, right? So take them and do this. Now, we're not reading all that tonight, and there's some other things that he gets into there, and and I'm going to try not to get in that because I'm, I'm after just the comparative pictures here, okay? Because the, the, the narrative of Israel in the wilderness also will overlay on this as well, okay? Because they were tempted in the wilderness, right? So that lays in here as well, but that's not what I'm looking at tonight. I'm just acknowledging that, that it's there because truth is layered, right? Truth, is, uh, truth has, has different layers to it that you can peel away or brush brush like you're excavating an archaeological dig. You get through, uh, you know, different layers of dirt to uh, uncover more of the body or the substance of what you're trying, of your discovery. So anyway, 
A wilderness is an unkept garden, or, or yes, yeah, an unkept garden, and it becomes it's unkept in two ways. The first of which is overgrowth. Tangles of brush and forestation make fluid movement impossible. When you get, you ever got tangled up in vines and and and, and tree limbs and and stuff, and you're trying to get your way through it, uh, thickets and all those kind of things. It is you get hung on everything, and and you really got to just kind of pick and work your way through it. You can't just get from point A to point B with any real efficiency. The efficiency comes in trying not to get hurt or injured or stuck with something, right? So that's one way, that's one aspect and one definition of a wilderness is that is that overgrowth and that entanglement of a, a mass of forestation that has not had any oversight, that's not had any uh, addressing, keeping, or tilling, and it's not had any kind of pruning or any kind of care care given to it, and so it becomes this out of control, uh, uh, just this out of control growth. That's one aspect of what wilderness can be. The other is desolation or a desert area, and that is as a result of uh, some type of catastrophic event or, uh, or drought or, uh, you know, something that is... Uh, that just kind of burns everything out and then it becomes barren. It becomes a wasteland uh, or at what I believe King James refers to. I think it's in the book of Deuteronomy where it uses the phrase a waste howling wilderness. Okay. And so it talks about the, the, you know, it's, so it's talking about a desert place. And so then when you start looking at some of the prophetic stuff, Right in Isaiah, the desert shall blossom like a rose. Right. So what? So what he's talking about to me is the recovery of what's been lost and the recovery of what's been damaged, of what's not been tended. That now, because there's a stream and there's life that comes through it, and there that the the, the desert gets reclaimed. It becomes what was a habitation of dragons and what was a habitation of jackals and owls now becomes the planting of the Lord. It becomes a place where where a, a, a people would come to flourish and and thrive. Right. So that speaks to me of paradise being restored. That's relationship. That's fellowship. That's prophetic imagery, right? And so, so think about those kind of things when you read those things, uh, you know, in your reading, in your study, in, the, in your time with God in the word, then, you know, think about some of these principles and some of these uh, images and and the, this language so that you can start to picture some things and and maybe broaden your horizon beyond just the ink or the print on the page. Amen. So all right, so it is a uh, a total lack of caregiving, uh, tilling, dressing or keeping, right? So that's how that's the two ways. It's either desolation, excuse me, barren wasteland, or it is a tangle, a brush, a, a, a brush harbor of, uh, of forestation and growth and vegetation that you, you know, that you can't hardly get through. Uh, that's, that's powerful stuff. I've heard stories about old cities that they have discovered in the Amazon jungle where within a hundred years, People had talked about them, discovers and talked about them, and because of whatever the death of the people or the moving away, that the jungle, because nobody was there to keep it beat back, that the jungle just overwhelmed it and just swallowed it all up, and you wouldn't know it's there. And so what I'm getting at is, is that sometimes there's more around us than we're aware of because it's swallowed up in a in a in in just the idea that we're not aware that it exists. We're not looking for it because most of the time we spend our time worrying about whether about the eternity after the afterlife and not the and not the quality of life that we have today that that carries us with some momentum into the afterlife. And I better leave that alone uh, because I don't necessarily want to get too caught up in all that. 
But what I'm after here is the picture of Jesus and, and how, how picture perfect that is. That if he's going to be tempted and he's the last man or he's the last Adam or the second man and he comes in, he's tempted in a wilderness. What Adam no longer took care of had, had either grown up and was in such a state of decay, turmoil, or, or destruction or desolation that Jesus would go. And I'm not saying he was in the same geographical spot Okay, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is there's representation in the imagery, amen? And so he goes to a wilderness. He goes to what's been unkept. He goes to what's been neglected. He goes to a place where nobody is. It's not, it's not inhabited, not fit for man or beast, but there were beasts there. Mark's gospel talks about him living with the wild beasts in, in, in Mark 1, 12 and 13, that's a fascinating uh, thing to think about, and I get started on that. That gets that will, uh, you know, take me someplace that I <laughs> don't want to get to tonight. But anyway, uh, he is he is he meets the challenge. And long story short, if you read these, you're going to find that he wins. He is triumphant. He is victorious. So where the first Adam fell and entered into and brought humanity into a, a, a different reality, a different quality of life, a different way of life, a different style and way of living, and brought and introduced us into uh, uh, multiple levels of, of frustration, futility, aggravation, uh, sorrow, uh, all of those kinds of things, and even even. Uh, death and so even those kind of things that the first Adam opened the door to, Jesus comes and he wins the victory. He overcomes with the faithfulness because what God said, what he knew to be true of him as the son of God, he did not have to respond to temptation when it comes calling. I will tell you that you do not have to respond to temptation. All you need to do is remember what the word says and remember and hide yourself. Thy word, David says, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Every response, every response of Christ to the temptation was word-based. Amen. It is written, man doesn't live by bread alone. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is, you know, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. So, so it's important that you have the, the, foundation of the of the written word not just uh, it more than just memory it's got to be p rhema part of your life part of your uh, of your thinking part of your the, the way and the manner in which you live not just that you can uh, uh, draw on it and quote it and recite it from memory that's a wonderful thing if you can do that God love you. God bless you. Uh, you know, I, I applaud that. But it needs to be more than just rote memory. It needs to be more than just remembering it or rereading it from from what you remember off of the page. It needs to be, uh, it, you know, it needs to be embedded in your character so that you will respond out of it. And that word's a part of you. It's not just a hollow, uh, it's not just something you would say without any substance to it, but it has life in it, it has meaning, and it carries you through. Amen? All right. So I wanted to talk about those things. And so that's, you know, it's important, I think, that that we see this. I also want to deal with this. I want to hit this while I'm here. And I know I'm, uh, forgive me, I'm jumping around a little bit, but I have spent most of my day chasing this stuff around and, you know, and my pathway through it is, you know, not always a direct line, right? So what I found fascinating in, uh, in this is that, you know, when Adam and Eve, when they yielded to the temptation, when they entered the doorway, the first thing they noticed was something that had always been true for them that they simply had not paid attention to. And that was the fact that they were naked. 
And so that sense of shame, that sense of vulnerability, that sense of, of guilt, that that need that now all of a sudden there's the need to cover, right? They've been living for however how long they've been, and they've been content to live without anything on, and it hasn't been a problem. But now because they're aware of more in a different dimension, in a different way, now it's an issue, right? Now it's a problem. Can I tell you that the result of that was that they withdrew from God and they hid themselves from his presence when he came faithfully to that, to that in the spirit of the day to walk in, in his voice, to walk with Adam, to communicate, to, to speak directly to him and to uh, enliven him with fellowship. Adam hid in the bushes. He hid in the, in the vegetation of the garden. He hid himself, he and Eve both, because they were naked and they were ashamed, right? So the result of that, there's a lot we can say about that, but the result of that, what I'm after is the, the inversion of that. What, what, do you, what do I mean by that? I mean how that flips in Messiah. Because see, when he is taken to the hall of Pilate and they decide to scourge him, they strip him. Jesus bears publicly a practically naked and he is beaten with a uh, with a whip probably a cat of nine tails uh, you know or a device similar to that and he is he is beaten uh, you know within within a stripe of his life right i think the the roman course of punishment 40 lashes from this whip would kill a man so it was 39 that they got because they didn't want him to die too soon. They want him to crucify him. So after they lash him, then they put the, they've got him stripped off. Then they put the purple robe on him, right? And so then they begin to mock him. They add insult to injury, and now they buffet him. They put the crown of thorns on him, and they begin to, they begin to uh, insult him and verbally abuse him and challenge him and spit on him and, uh, and, and behave in physical, engage in physical, verbal, uh, uh, abuse, uh, assault, and all of that stuff. And then they take that off of him when they're finished with that. They put his clothes, they put his garments back on him so that he can carry the cross. And as he carries the cross, when it comes time to crucify him, then they strip him off because they're going to part his garments and they're going to gamble for them. They're going to, they're, they're going to gamble for his vesture, for his garments, and he is going to hang. He's going to bear the nakedness of humanity on the cross of Calvary and Everything that we had that was part of the shame of the original fall, Jesus, Jesus nails it to his tree. And I tell you, that just works on me, folks. That gets me excited. That that absolutely uh, causes me to think that he so loved us. He so wanted to free us from shame, free us from guilt, free us from the effect of the of the knowledge of good and evil, free us us from the from the failed temptation of the former that he might bring us into a new life and so so here's what here's what happens is that when he is crucified they wrap him in a linen garment and they take him in but he is he is uh, uh, probably just has on just enough to cover uh, uh, you know his uh, you know his, his uh, man region, so to speak, and so he's he's taken in and carried in in the blanket in the linen cloth, and he's laid in a tomb. And when he's when he's laid there, then what happens is when he rises the third day, he's clothed upon with a new body. He's clothed upon with glory. He's clothed upon. Can I interest you in a savior? Hey, that is absolutely wants to take your shame, your guilt, your your defeat, and nail it to his cross so that when he raised from the dead, he can clothe you with the glory of his presence. 
Hey, with your house from heaven, he can clothe you with something grand, with something with meaning, with something that's wise, with something that's greater than what we thought we were worthy of. I'm about to get happy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I wasn't even planning on really touching on that, but man, that that got in there. So let's go to, to uh, Hebrews 2. And I want to read uh, Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. You say, yeah, we know this. We, you know, we, we've heard all this before, but you haven't heard it in this context. Because of what he's doing, he changes the game. All right? And what I mean by that is, is that now... See, it was pass or fail, right? With, with Adam and Adam failed. Jesus passed. Now, because of who he is and what he's done, because he was triumphant, you and I can be triumphant. He sets us on this side of temptation so that it doesn't have to destroy our life, so that it doesn't have to ruin our reality of life as we know it based on what God has done. It doesn't have to do that because he is, he, let's, let's read uh, before I get fired up again and get carrying on and come out of the chair. Uh, Hebrews 2, start with verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. That's the serpent, according to Revelation, that, oh, that great dragon, that serpent, the devil, and Satan, right? Those are the four descriptive terms that is, uh, that is ascribed to him in the book of Revelation. So, so he defeats the snake. He defeats him because what he does is he takes away his power to deceive. He takes away his power to distort. He takes away his power to, uh, to, uh, uh, to muddy the water, if you will. Hallelujah. So what happens is, is now death that we knew nothing about, the great unknown, the, 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 the grave, the dark, and what's beyond that, what lies beyond, and the great debate between the secular and the sacred uh, is that there's nothing beyond, that it's just the end of it. And then in the secular and in the sacred, it's the, well, there's an eternity, uh, both good and bad out there. And so there's this debate that is uh, in... in empirically speaking, is not exactly provable in, in, in that sense. Uh, it, both are a matter of faith, and I'm going to say that to you that way. So that I, I would rather believe in that there's something more. Jesus showed us something more when he rose from the dead and he showed himself for 40 days to his disciples, he was saying to us, there is more. This doesn't end with a trip to the undertaker. It doesn't end with, be, with being shoved in a, in, a, in a six foot deep, seven foot long uh, uh, hole in the ground and three and a half feet wide or four feet wide. It doesn't end there. That's not the end of the story. A tomb, uh, an, an, an empty, a tomb where, that he was laid in is empty now because that's not the end of the story. A corpse in a coffin, a, a coffin in a grave, uh, a, a coffin or a casket in a mausoleum or a marble tomb is not the end of the story. Ashes in an urn is not the end of the story. Hallelujah. Because he has shown us a glimpse beyond and we take it on faith. Amen. Because the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He likewise took part of the same. He became what you and I were. He took upon him the likeness of sinful flesh, Romans 8 says. And so he, in all points, he, was, he, he came so that the full human experience would belong to him and he could redefine it and he could show us the real uh, uh, desire of God for humanity in the, light, in the sonship of Messiah. And so what he wants to do through that is bring many sons into that glory. Amen. 
Okay, so he, took, he not only takes part in our flesh and blood, but through death he destroys him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death. See, people fear what they do not know. We fear what we do not understand. We are, that's, that is, that is a truth that applies on many levels and in many different areas of life, uh, you know. So, and I don't want to get started on some of that tonight, but he delivered us through the fear of death. We were subject to being bound. We were bound by that fear. But when he breaks the yoke of fear, when he breaks that in, in, in dying our death, he destroys the power of the devil, which is to fear monger and to make afraid, right? And by fear those who would impose the yoke of fear upon you do it to control you. That's all there is to it. That's the. Uh, it may not be the initial, uh, the initial desire, but once you find out, you can manipulate and control people by fear. That's why we use it in church, folks. That's why we've done it for so long. We're not built for that. We're not designed for that. You need to, we need to find a better way. We need to, we need to get, get a revelation of what the gospel really is so that we're not trying to scare everybody. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to say it this way, forgive me, to we're not trying to scare hell out of everybody. Praise the Lord. We, we're, we want to show them the way of life, the way of redemption, the way of peace, the way of joy and righteousness. We want to show them a quality of life that is worthwhile, not just dangle them over a uh, sulfur and brimstone to try to make them do the things we want them to do. Jesus came to deliver us from that. He delivered us from that fear. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful, listen to this, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, because he's been tempted and he suffered 40 days of temptation. And not only there, he was, he was tempted in the garden. He was, he was tempted to uh, try to modify the plan in the garden, right? He had other moments. He was tempted by theologians and practitioners of the law. He was tempted to uh, respond when they, uh, when they tried to trick him and, and try in his words and tried to lay traps for him verbally verbally to catch him up in things. And he navigated those things because he was not a servant of fear. But he has suffered being tempted because he suffered and he overcame because he was victorious in every instance. He is able to succor or help or uh, aid or assist them that are tempted. Can I tell you, temptation is not sin. When you feel tempted to speak, uh, uh, say something uh, uh, inflammatory or something derogatory or something that is injurious, when you are tempted to do something or uh, or behave in a manner that is uh, that is unseemly for you, then you need to realize that you have an advocate. You have you have, you are connected to the one who can navigate this and help you through it on the on the proper side of it so that you don't get into that mess but if you do he's still able to help you litigate you out help you to find your way back right because this is a different day because he was victorious ultimately you and I are victorious all right I got to move on. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go. I think I'm ready to go to Genesis 3 and 23. So we're jumping back to Genesis. Whew. Got a lot to unpack here. Seems to be the story of my life, right? And the story of your life while you're listening. <laughs> Huh? 
Amen. All right. So we are now after the temptation, after the fall, after the first priestly act described or or I will not describe but alluded to in scripture. Uh, God replaced the uh, fig leaves, the apron fig leaves with animal skins. So that tells me God demonstrated sacrifice. Abel got that idea somewhere. All right. And I'm going to leave that alone. But Abel, Abel saw that. He, it was handed down to him, he, and he gave himself to it, all right? So anyway, so he covered them with animal skins, and so therefore, I'm in verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, so I want to talk about some of this. Praise the Lord. When he drove them out, the word, you know, he drove them out. He sent them forth to till the ground. So he drove out the man. Literally, that's the same Hebrew phrase that's used in later in Genesis where when Abraham casts out the bondwoman, okay? So the idea behind this is, is, that, is that what you've known, how you've known paradise has changed forever here. And now you go out into the ground from whence you came for the, where I made you, where I breathed life into you. After I did that, I brought you to this place. Now, because you have... Uh, you have yielded to temptation, you have fallen, you've sinned, now you step out of this. And so this garden now becomes the fence and the gate closes to the garden. Amen. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims. And I, that's fascinating to me. This is the first use of the word cherubims. So we're going to go somewhere with this. I'm going to do it tonight. I couldn't get to it last week. We're going to get there tonight. Uh, the, the next time the word cherub, or which is translated cherubim, is used is in Exodus 25, verses 18 through 20. And he's giving them, he is giving Moses the imagery for the mercy seat. So that's powerful, Right? We talk about Christ being the propitiation or the mercy seat, okay? So there's something about what man has been driven out of or cast out of, that there are two, there are cherubims, there's two of them, and I believe that they're facing one another. I believe that there is a flaming sword that is between them, and it says it turns every way, and we you know, uh, you know, some folks see that as a spinning sword, uh, you know, like the hand on a clock or something, perhaps, or whatever. And 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 I don't. I'm I'm going to deal with that here in just a little bit, hopefully. But this idea that he puts these cherubims here, and then he doesn't say this anymore until he gives Moses the schematic for for the Ark of the Covenant and the and the mercy seat that sits on top of it, the lid. The, the expi expiatory place, the place of atonement, the place of pardon, the place where sacrifice and redemption becomes a reality. And so it is there that, the, that this word shows up again. So I'm imagery-wise, the, the way to the tree of life is contained somewhere in this mystery. It's contained somewhere in this idea of the... Uh, of, of what God has to say, uh, how the imagery that God sets there, right? So, so just hold on to that for a little bit because I want to break this down even further. And it says it is a flaming sword. The word flaming means blazing, but it's also translated in Exodus 7 as enchantments. So there is this, there is this quality, this... Uh, 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 otherworldly quality to the flame, all right? 
Uh, and basically where it's translated enchantments in in Exodus 7, it has to do with the magicians of Pharaoh uh, imitating the miracles of Moses, okay? That's what, that's the same word. It's translated flaming is translated as enchantments there. So there's, so what I'm after here is that there's a demonstration of power realized in the earth that is set and it's, it is, it's blazing. It is a, it's flaming. It is a, uh, an otherworldly passion or fire or uh, 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 that is designed to uh, to be to brilliantly illuminate and light the way. Think about the, the you know the mercy seat on the day of atonement. There was the the fire pan uh, that sat in front of it, and the incense that brought the cloud. And then in the cloud there was this this bright form, the shape of God that showed up as if He were sitting there on His throne, right? And so this this flaming sword. This is there's some Something about that that brilliance, that brilliant cloud, that that glory of his presence, that face to face encounter that would be uh, so sacred and so highly esteemed and revered throughout the uh, throughout the entire history of Judaism. Now it becomes becomes connected, in my opinion, to this. It starts to show us, it starts to take shape. And then when you look at it, it says the sword, and, and I love this, it's a cutting instrument, but here, this is important. It comes from the word that means drought. Remember how I described, remember how I described a, uh, a, 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 um, an unkept garden, right? The two ways was a tangled, uh, a tangled mass of forestation and vegetation that was out of control, or it was uh, the the result. Uh, it was barren, and the result of a drought is barrenness. So, can I tell you that this sword has to do with the drought? Can I tell you Jesus came to end the drought of God's silence because He was a word spoken from heaven. That word like a two-edged sword that gleams with the light of God, hey, that is designed to show and, and, and present you and I with a word of life and a word of truth that cuts both ways, but it's designed to cut and give us life. If I can, I'm going to jump over right now to uh, Hebrews 4. And I would love to read from verses four all the way through the rest of the chapter. I encourage you to do it, but I've been nearly an hour, so I need to try to get through this. So I want to jump down to verse 12, all right, because he's talking about the seventh day. That's the part of creation, right, where God rested. So he's talking about that. He's talking about how that, I know King James says that Jesus didn't, uh, when uh, if Jesus had given them rest, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. But it's literally should be saying Joshua because the names are the same because the Greek translation, Eosis for Joshua, uh, becomes, it gets translated as Jesus in King James. But he's really talking about Joshua leading them into the promised land that was supposed to be the rest that God was always talking about, right? And yet they never achieved it. Even though they went into the promised land, even though they became part of that, they didn't, <clears throat> the rest God was really talking about was only laid in it, embedded in it, encrypted in it as a metaphor because God was talking about a lifestyle, a life of peace and grace that only comes by faith in Messiah, by saving grace, amazing grace and saving faith that revolutionizes our outlook, our persona, our character, and now we have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost because that has he has come to dwell in us and be our comforter and be our keeper. And so, so there's so much of this, but, but what I'm after here, let's go to verse 12. I apologize for hurrying through this. I didn't want to do it this way, but such such is life. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive and and 
full of energy. It's quick and powerful. I'm going to read you a footnote out of the Passion Translation for this because it comes to bear on what we're saying. I will read the, let me read the verse to you out of the Passion Translation, then I will read the footnote. Since I saved you the other stuff, I'm going to do it this way. 4 and 12, Hebrews 4.12, Passion Translation says, For we have the living word of God, which is full of energy, like a two-mouthed sword. It will even penetrate to the very core of our being where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet, where we all come together, right? Where we are whole, where we are complete and officially together. That's what the word of God's come to do, man. Oh, help me, Lord. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our hearts. So here's the footnote. The Aramaic can be translated all effective, okay? There is a hint here of the spinning sword of fire held by the angel guarding the way to the tree of life. So that's why, so, so think about this for a minute. If the word of God, so that if, think about this for a minute. If that sword, you know, he, they refer to it as a spinning sword, and a lot of people do that. I need to get these off. I don't need the fine print anymore. Makes the camera fuzzy to me. Uh, anyway, if the sword is flaming, now when it means that it, it uh, turns every way, when it means to keep, it means it guards it. And I believe it means it, it does it to, in a way to preserve the entrance. We think of it in many ways when we teach it, we, we teach it as it guards to keep us out, to keep us away from it. But what if it's just to preserve the entrance? What if it's just to say, we're not going to lose this thing. It's not going to be lost to you. But, but I've got a way back in and it's between the cherubim. It is a sword on fire, and when it turns every way, we think of it as spinning, kind of like a, a you know, a clock, uh, maybe, or or some kind of a, a rotational device to prevent anybody from passing through. And 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 I'm not going to tell you that that's wrong. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to present it to you from a different vantage point. If this sword is on flame or it's gleaming so brightly that it looks like a shaft of light. If the point is down between the cherubim, can I tell you that a sword with a handle and the point down is going to look like a cross? Can I interest you in, in, an, in an idea here that, 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 so let me talk about this for a minute. Turned every, every way means to overturn. It means to turn about or overthrow or convert. Can I, can I interest you in an idea that if you encounter the light of the cross and the sword that is quick and powerful, the word of God, he whose name is called the word of God, and when that penetrates your soul and spirit and joints and marrow, that it makes you whole. And when it makes you whole, it opens you to come into a relationship Relationship of paradise and now enter into and eat of the tree of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Understand that in Revelation 2 and 7 to the Ephesian church, I think it's the very first church that Christ speaks to. He says, he that overcomes, I will grant to to eat of the tree of life. So God's not closing that up to get to heaven. I don't think he's telling them about going to heaven. I think he's talking about a relationship. He's talking about a life. He's talking about uh, an eternal life that becomes relevant to you and I today. I'm not doing this justice. I've got one more scripture and then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna try to shut her down. Okay, go to Luke 23 and 43. It is no secret or mystery to me from what we're talking about here that on the cross, 
as one thief is railing against him and the other checks him. The other says, buddy, we deserve what we're getting. This man hadn't done anything. And so what's he do? He's suspended. He's nailed to a cross himself. But but in his spirit, he falls on the mercy of God. In his spirit, he looks over, hallelujah, and he looks at the word of God who is quick and powerful. And in real time, he's bleeding and he's dying and he is shedding his blood for our forgiveness and for our redemption. But in the in the in in real time, that's what we see. We see a broken, we see a battered, we see a wounded, we see a savior that is maligned and abused. We see a savior who is weak and suffering. But can I tell you that in the spirit, there is a a shaft of light. Hallelujah. That cross is on fire with passion and it is a sword. Looks like a sword pointed down that he is nailed to. And between the cherubim, hey, between all that God has said is true of you redemptively, he looks at that man when he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says today, oh, today thou shalt be with with me in paradise. Today, paradise is opening up. Today, there's a flaming word that is turning over ages and generations of type and shadow. It is moving of the, the borders and the boundaries that have long been overgrown, that have long been left desolate, and it is now bringing you into opening to you a criminal who can do nothing for me, you can only believe that today, that future happiness, that place that we reserve for over yonder today, you're going to be with me in paradise. I'm open in paradise and you, son, can come in with me because, hallelujah, I came to save and the the the. the I came to seek and to save all that are lost, all that are broken, all that would look to me to find mercy and grace. Can I tell you some things turned over right there? Can I tell you there was a conversion on that sword? In in metaphor and in spirit, he fell on that sword and it pierced that quick and powerful word, that two-edged sword, that two-mouthed sword, the mouth of the Son of Man and the mouth of the Son of God, who was all man and all God, and he spoke from both realms. He spoke from them, he spoke for them, and he spoke into both realms. And when he did that, he opened paradise. Paradise. And now you and I can live and we can walk with him in the spirit of the day. We can now be indwelt by that same spirit. Whew. Praise God. <laughs> Losing my mind in here, right? Hallelujah. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, I hope and pray that what we are sharing here, and see, it changes everything. It's turning everything over because that's what that sword's designed to do. That light, he is that sword. It's in his mouth. It's what he speaks. It's what he declares. It's whatever he says is true of you redemptively. It's true of me redemptively. And what he says changes us. It opens us to a relationship. He that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I overcame and sat with my father in his. Jesus takes a tree of death and he makes it a tree of life. And in that turning over, in that conversion, in that revolution, in that overthrowing, in that overturning, the way into paradise is open. I talk about the veil being rent in the temple, right? A lot. I talk about that relatively often. It becomes, it's just so, the imagery of it is so uh, important 
to understand that it's a way into his presence has been opened now, according to the book of Hebrews. And I often talk about all the constellations embroidered on the, on the, on the, uh, on the veil, but also embroidered on the veil are two cherubims. Parted so that there is now access. What had been locked up, what had been kept secret, what had been sequestered and kept away is now open and the way into the most holy place is now made manifest. Let's pray. I need to quit. <laughs> you need to go to bed and I need to quit, right? <clears throat> so let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for this opportunity to get in your word. I'm grateful, Father, for this opportunity to share and to communicate and impart to all those who are listening, Father God, hope, grace, joy, gladness, strength, and peace. Lord, you have, you have made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we will reign with you in the earth. And I thank you for that, and I bless you. And I truly ask, Lord, that you seal this word to our hearts. And I truly ask, Father, that you would allow our eyes to be opened, that we might see our ears to be opened, that we might hear that your name would be glorified. Father God, you are worthy of praise. And I thank you that today we can be with you, hallelujah, in paradise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of announcements real quick. For those of you who gave Sunday in the offering, thank you so much for your obedience. Uh, we're going to extend that into this Sunday as well. So if you didn't get a chance to give, you will have an opportunity this weekend. So ask the Lord, be obedient. Also, don't forget to spring forward Saturday night. Amen. We love you. Have a blessed night. And have a great rest of the week. Finish strong.